Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. In our previous episode, Dr. Andrew Snelling of Answers in Genesis joined us to talk about scientific methods used to date the Earth. We, uh, through that episode, talked about the problems with these methods, and he's back today to continue our discussion. Dr. Snelling, welcome back for part two. Hi, Henry. Good to be with you again. again. Yeah, good to be with you. Thank you for all of, of your expertise in that first episode. We want to encourage people to go back and watch that uh, episode. Uh, in one case, we learned about a rock that rocks that we know were 10 years old that yielded dates of millions of years, and we know that there's real serious problems with some of these dating methods. But we're going to shift our discussion to a different kind of dating method, called carbon-14 or radio, radio, excuse me, radiocarbon dating. Uh, if you could begin our, our episode here talking about that, just discuss that and give the audience a tutorial on that. Well, f well first of all, it, it's one of the radioactive dating methods because it's radioactive carbon that decays to nitrogen. And, but it's different because um, uh, carbon-14 forms in the atmosphere as a result of cosmic rays producing fast-moving neutrons that collide with uh, nitrogen atoms in the upper atmosphere to produce radiocarbon. And uh, <clears throat> that radiocarbon forms carbon dioxide. It's in the air we breathe. It's in the air that the plants take in when they photosynthesize. And the radiocarbon gets into their tissues, the plant tissues that is eaten by animals. And so it gets into the animals. And so quite frankly, uh, Henry, that means the food we eat has got radiocarbon in it and we're adding radiocarbon to our, our bodies. And so each of us are actually radioactive with radiocarbon. <laughs> and by the way, I, sh I should add here, when, when we talk about dating rocks, people think we date rocks with radiocarbon. No, we don't because uh, most rocks don't have uh, carbon in them. The other distinction is that whereas uranium to decaying to lead takes supposedly millions of years, it's a very, very slow process, radiocarbon decays very rapidly by comparison. Uh, we, we have a term called a half-life. You know, people might have heard that term and it sounds strange, but basically it's this. If you start with a pound of radiocarbon, in one half-life, you've got half a pound left half a pound has decayed, has decayed away. And so the problem is that, that uh, with each half-life, you get less and less and less and less until, until you've got hardly any left. And so, um, uh, you know, it's 5,730 years is a very short time span compared to the millions of years that the, the geologists talk about. Now, the interesting thing is there's a difference here, of course, because as long as an animal lives or a plant lives, it takes in more radiocarbon. But when it dies, it stops taking in radi radiocarbon, just like we. And so the method works like this. Say we've lost the birth certificate for your grandma or your great-grandma, and you want to find how long ago she died. Well, you go to the, back to the graveyard, you dig up her bones, and you submit them for radiocarbon dating, and you find out how much radiocarbon is left in her bones and you compare it to the amount of radiocarbon in your bones because when she died she stopped eating and taking in more radiocarbon so there's a difference some of the, the radiocarbon that was in her bones when she died has decayed away now and so by determining how much has decayed away and the rate of decay we can figure out how long ago she died and so that's how the method works and so, for example, in archaeology, we go to the ruins, uh, you know, we dig up the ruins of, of a place and we find uh, pottery jars with grain in them. And, of course, the grain was from the, the harvest that occurred just before the destruction. So that helps us. And then we radiocarbon those gr that grain because when the grain was harvested, it stopped taking in more radiocarbon. And we can work out how much radiocarbon is left in the grain in the in the jar in the archaeological site, dig site compared to the radiocarbon in the grain today and so that tells you how long ago that was harvested and it was only months before the destruction of that at that level archaeological level and so that's that's how archaeologists use radiocarbon it's a very powerful tool and it's potentially very helpful uh, because 
you know, if, if we get radar carbon dates that confirm our biblical chronology, notice I said confirm because the biblical chronology is absolute. God was there and he's given us the dates. I mean, he's t told us how old Noah was when Noah went on board the ark and he told us all the details of, of how long the flood went on and etc. And he told us how old Abraham was when he had Isaac and, and how old Isaac was when he had Jacob. And so the, the chronological details are very clear there in Scripture that God has given us. And that's a good reason for that, because Scripture records Jesus's history. Yes. And how we, we know that he's our kinsman redeemer because his history is recorded there. We can trace Jesus' ancestry back to Adam. And so we know that he's bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh and could die on the cross on our behalf. And so this is all rooted in, in you know, the Genesis is the foundation. The roots of the gospel are back there in the Genesis history that we have there in the scriptures. And that's why it's very important when we yeah. dig up the past to to understand these details in the light of scripture that's 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 excellent i um so uh you got about a minute and a half in this segment i hear crucial assumptions though that are built into these methodologies maybe you could give an overview of these crucial assumptions that are yes, there well there's the decay rate and so we're pretty sure the decay rate of radiocarbon has been constant although there may have been some variation for example during the flood or before the flood we don't know that for sure and even after the flood when the earth was recovering after the flood but what about the starting conditions well we weren't back there before the flood to know there was a lot more carbon in the atmosphere in the atmosphere in the biosphere before the flood because it was a good world it was luxuriant vegetation and we see that vegetation buried in the in the in the geological record and then the, the standard arguments don't take into account what happened during the flood when a lot of carbon was buried during the flood to form the oil and the coal coal layers that we dig up today and so these are crucial. We don't know the starting conditions. We don't know about contamination, what's happened, and the, the decay rate. We have to make assumptions about it being constant. Yeah, that seems to be a good tutorial. But, uh, you know, for me, uh, as a, as a non-specialist in this area, the area, the question has always been about the flood. Now, you know, to me, it's clear, and to us, it's clear that this is a universal event, uh, that it destroyed the whole world. And if that's the case, then going back in time, as we get closer to it, these dates are going to be off. Yep. Uh, well, be for, exa for example, we have billions of tons of coal, which is buried plants, fossilized plants. These were plants that were alive before the flood. In fact, the earth was probably far better uh, vegetated than it is today. So there was a lot more carbon in the pre-flood world that got buried. And so that changes the dynamics. There was a lot of normal carbon, a lot more normal carbon yes. and less radiocarbon in the pre-flood world than the present world. Yeah, and, and that, so that changes. And that's not accounted, accounted for no. in the secular models. Not so, at all. But let's hold that thought, Dr. Snelling. We're up on a break, and uh, folks, we're talking about dating methods uh, related to the Bible and science, and we'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Dr. Andrew Snelling, and we're talking about dating methods. Today, we're talking about carbon-14 dating. Now, Dr. Snelling, just to pick up, uh, finish off the last segment, um, what is the outermost possible theoretical date for carbon-14? And then we're going to segue into its relationship to the other dating that we talked about. 1,730 years was the approximate half-life. And so you get less and less quantities. Theoretically, uh, 90,000 years is the outside limit for radiocarbon dating. Um, practically, it's probably closer to 60 or 70,000 years. But I like to sum it up like this. If every atom of the Earth was radiocarbon, 
within a million years, there'd be not one single atom left. And so that means anything that's millions of years old should not have any radiocarbon in it. And that's a good segue into some examples that we know from, our own, from the secular literature and from our own research. Um, I've been involved in researching this issue for a number of years, and some years ago we, we got diamonds from, from Africa and uh, other parts of the world and submitted them to a lab for radiocarbon dating. Now, these diamonds are supposed to be one to three billion years old. They come from inside the Earth, so they weren't exposed to the Earth's atmosphere, so they shouldn't have radiocarbon in them because the radiocarbon is formed up in the atmosphere. Okay, and yet what happened is they, they, these diamonds gave ages up to 60,000 years, radiocarbon ages. They had radiocarbon still in them. And by the way, Henry, um, we presented these results at the annual meeting in December 2003 of the American Geophysical Union in, in San Francisco as a poster and one of the people who saw that was at the radiocarbon lab at UC Riverside, where they have, and he went back to his own radiocarbon lab, got diamonds, and replicated our results. And he published the replication of our results. So it's not as if we made up these results. Right. Um, they've been verified by the secularists. So this is a, and, secu a secular conference that you did this, a secular conference that you presented yes, this information at. Yes, yes. absolutely. And a secular scientist went away and his own lab verified these results. And so how could you have radiocarbon in diamonds that are deep inside the Earth that are supposed to be one to three billion years old? It means that these diamonds, uh, the diamonds are related to the origin of the Earth because they were formed early in the Earth's history. We know that. Uh, they're intrinsic to the makeup of the Earth. And so that radiocarbon must have been in, the, in, the, in them soon after they were created or subsequent after the fall, uh, the atoms, carbon atoms became stable, unstable in the diamonds. And so this is an independent chronometer and, and it disproves the other dating methods of hundreds and billions of years, hundreds yes. of millions and bi billions of years. Yes. And so it tells us that there's something wrong with these dates of billions of years for the age of the Earth. If these diamonds give you radiocarbon ages of only uh, you know, thousands of years, and those are even inflated because of the assumptions that we've talked about already. Years ago, I also was starting to look into this method, and I started collecting fossilised wood samples from different locations, uh, from England, from Australia, from uh, rock layers that have been dated independently by fossils and uh, uh, you know the position in in the in the geologic record, and you know these were these were fossil wood samples that were supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old, and yet they all had radiocarbon in them that dated the fossil wood as only uh, thousands of years old, tens of thousands of years old. Now, um, it, this is even known in the secular literature. Uh, a, 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 a guy I know. Uh, a creationist went back through all the secular literature and he documented all these, he, 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 uh, calibra he, he listed out all these dates that were radiocarbon dates that were obtained on, on shells, uh, corals, clams, you know, fossils like that from coal, oil, diamond, natural gas, um, limestone, uh, marble, um, and graphite. In fact, graphite that's supposed to be a billion years old give, can give you a radiocarbon age of only tens of thousands of years. All of them had radiocarbon in them. Samples that are supposedly hundreds of millions of years old all had radiocarbon. And this was in the secular literature. So we have three things of the strength of the argument. One is they should, cont they should contain no radiocarbon. Correct. Two, two, because they're, of the decay rate. Because of the decay rate. Two, they're found in various locations around the world. And, and three, it's published in the secular literature, so there's no way to accuse us as creationists That's as right. fudging the data. Yeah. That's right. In fact, what happened is the scientists were trying to check their equipment, and so they thought, well, these samples are hundreds of millions of years old. They shouldn't have radiocarbon in them, and therefore our equipment should give you a zero age. And when they got ages of 
tens of thousands of years, they're, they're scratching their heads, still trying to figure out what's going on. So let's let's reiterate, we're talking about carbon dates, which we also think are flawed, but we're using it as a wedge against this other millions of years dating method. So uh, the, the key um, thing that's missing in the radiocarbon dating, which we think also needs to come way down, is the flood. Let's go with a final minute on that, Andrew, to yep. re reiterate the importance of the worldview paradigm with the flood. You got about a minute. Yeah, well, the flood is so crucial because we had all this, say, vegetation and the animals prior to the flood, whatever the carbon, radiocarbon content of the world was like before the flood, all that material got buried only thousands of years ago, the biblical chronology, four and a half, five thousand years ago, depending which text you use. And uh, all that carbon was buried and the atmosphere was totally disrupted where the carbon-14 is produced today. And so you had to have a re-equilibration process after the flood as things cranked up again after the flood. So ignoring the flood is totally crucial to understanding radiocarbon. If you ignore the flood, like the secularists do, you're going to get wrong, wrong uh, interpretation of the radiocarbon results. Yeah, this is the most really significant event, I mean, besides creation and the fall, really in the history of the world and in, largely in Western civilization, it's ignored, it's, yep. it's written off as a myth and a fairy tale. Well, I, me I mentioned all these fossils that had radiocarbon dates, they're all materials, animals that were buried by the flood. And so they date to the flood and the, the Bible tells us what that, what that age should be. Yeah. So yeah. we have an independent standard given to us by God himself. Yeah, this is the way to, to really calibrate these dates. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for this episode of Digging for Truth. We're with Dr. Andrew Snelling. We'll be right back after this message. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. I'm here with Dr. Andrew Snelling, who's a geologist, and we're talking about dating methods and the problems with them related to the age of the world and the book of Genesis. So, um, Dr. Snelling, we were talking about carbon-14. We've been talking about throughout this episode. Let's talk about an, uh, one of the important universal phenomenon uh, around the world, and that's coal beds. Uh, tell the audience about that. Yeah, well, coal is the remains of plants. Uh, particularly the woody material that was buried during the flood. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, it's a great way to test radiocarbon and because if, if we're right, the Earth is only thousands of years old, then uh, plant materials like that should have radiocarbon in them. And so uh, I was involved in a project where we got 10 coal samples from different coal beds from around the USA. We actually got them. They're stored by the Department of Energy at uh, a facility at the uh, University of Pennsylvania and uh, in Penn, in Penn, at Penn State University, I should say. And they're stored under an argon atmosphere to, to preserve them. Uh, it's a, they routinely sample from all around the USA. And so we selected for research 10 samples that spanned an age from 330 million years, conventional age, down to ages of about 40 million years. And so, uh, you know, conventionally, they were hundreds of millions of years different. And yet, these 10 coal samples from different coal beds around the US, USA, from different, uh, different standard uh, conventional ages, all came in with the same radiocarbon age, 48,500 radiocarbon years. Now, that didn't surprise us. Why? because they are all pre-flood trees buried by the flood. So you would expect them all to be the same age, yes. or roughly the same age, when they are buried by the flood, 
which we know happened on a particular day in a particular month on a particular year of Noah's life, which is calibrated by the chronology given us in the scriptures. And so we weren't surprised that they all yielded the same age. And, and yet for the secularists, this is, this is just incredible. I mean, uh, if every atom of the earth was, was radiocarbon, it'd all be gone in a million years. And yet here these coal beds that are supposed to be 40 to 330 million years old all have the same radiocarbon age, have radiocarbon in them to begin with. And so this is a, a problem to the secular community because this flies in the face of all their other dating methods, all the other uranium, lead, potassium, argon that we've talked about, rubidium, strontium, on a previous episode, and, and yet it confirms the biblical time scale. And it, it means, Henry, that we have a way, if we, if we can go to known archaeological sites and radiocarbon yes. date them, we can actually recalibrate radiocarbon dating and make it a powerful tool to support the biblical chronology. You know, people love to know about dinosaurs, and I've got friends, and you've interviewed one of them, that have been looking at soft tissue in dinosaurs. Most people don't know that dinosaur bones have also been dated by radiocarbon, and they too have radiocarbon in them. I've got a friend who recently published a paper in the secular literature, uh, published by the University of Cambridge in, in England, uh, in which he was documenting blood clots in blood vessels in a dinosaur. So, I mean, this soft tissue shouldn't have survived for 66, 66 70 million years. Yes, yes. And yet it's still there. And we're not surprised by that. And when we find radiocarbon in coal and oil, uh, in diamonds, and, and in dinosaur bones. So, um, you know, it's a great time to be a, a biblical creationist who believes God's word as the inerrant, inspired eyewitness testimony of the earth's history. God can be trusted. He doesn't tell lies. And it's the foundation of our faith. If we can't trust the history that God's given us in the Bible, how can we trust um, the gospel message? Because Jesus said in John 3, 12, if you don't believe the earthly things I'm going to, I tell you, how are you going to believe the heavenly things? And then four verses later, he says, for well, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus talked about the creation. You know, from the beginning of the creation, God the, made them male and female. Yes. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father or mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And he also spoke of the flood coming and taking them all away. And he was talking about in the context of his second coming. His second coming is going to be global. So comparing it to the flood means the flood was global as well. Yeah, we, we the evidence is enormous for that, and I, I and I you know we had an episode with you a couple of years ago. We'll put that up on the screen for folks to refer to. Uh, I'll give you about one more minute. Uh, I w just uh, one more thing on the dinosaurs. I want you to just emphasize the importance of dinosaurs for the long age evolutionary argument. Yeah, they've been the poster child because kids and people are fascinated with dinosaurs. You know, terrible lizards, and so they're promoted even now as supposedly you know, feathered dinosaurs on the way to becoming birds. And they, they sometimes call chickens today as still dinosaurs. Birds were dinosaurs or dinosaurs were birds. And it's the poster child for the whole idea of millions of years of evolution. <clears throat> and if we can show that the millions of years are wrong because the dinosaurs uh, uh, have radiocarbon, their bones have radiocarbon in them, and we can still find the soft tissue as if it was still fresh, from only thousands of years ago buried in the flood, then it debunks the whole idea, not only of the millions of years, but of evolution. And therefore the Bible is right that God is our creator. He judged the world during the flood and we're gonna to account to him when he comes again and judges the world the second time by fire. Amen to that. Uh, my friend, Andrew, thank you so much for joining it's a us. pleasure always, Henry. Well, we, help. we love you, we appreciate you and we're grateful for your expertise and coming on the show. Thanks for being here. Pleasure. Now, friends, I just wanted to wrap up the show by appealing to you about this issue of the age of the world. It's talking about Moses and his writings and that relationship to Jesus. Now, in Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11, it the scriptures tell us to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, and the seventh day you shall rest. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, 
If you believed Moses, you would believe me. But if you do not believe his writings, meaning the book of Genesis and all that he wrote, how will you believe my words? And so we appeal to the authority of Jesus as it relates to the issue of origins. And we hope that you'll consider this today. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Digging for Truth.